Hey everyone, Ben Botkin here. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about strings and woodwinds. Specifically, I'm going to be creating, uh, well, I've already, already created it, but I want to show you a piece of music that's kind of in a sort of a BC, uh, BBC sort of historical drama style. And I, I created it primarily with um, musical sampling, soaring strings and adventure strings and Berlin woodwinds. So I want to show you a little bit about how I made this, uh, made this uh, this piece of music and some of the orchestration and compositional principles uh, behind it. But to, but to begin with, uh, I'll just go ahead and play uh, play the entire piece from beginning to end and open up the MIDI so we can we can have a look at what's going on and then we will talk more from there. So this is I wrote this for a a educational institution called Hillsdale College. It was for some online courses. So anyway, that's what this is the Hillsdale theme, I guess. Here we go. <laughs> So anyway, there is, there's the piece. As you can see, this is primarily, uh, there's there's actually no brass in the piece. Uh, there's a little bit of choir uh, here towards the end. Some percussion, mostly to add accent. Uh, so basically, this is a piano, strings, and woodwind piece. Uh, a couple notes, uh, just compositional notes, I'll, I think I'll start with first before I talk about the libraries I'm using and how I'm using them. Um, so this was originally going to, uh, this, this is an extended piece that's based on, um, let's get, I kind of created like a 20 second intro for like an intro sequence. And uh, this is an, like an extended, uh, an extended statement of that theme. So I needed to come up with something, uh, something that was clear, something that could kind of work in a short bit 
in, you know, in, in a, in a you know, four or eight bar statement, but then, you know, this is basically an expansion of that. So I've got this, a very simple basic melody. And I wanted to, I wanted to kind of focus on the fourths and the fifths and the octave as the, as the primary intervals that we're using. And it's just, it, there's some clarity and some nobility uh, in the use of these intervals. Now on its own, it's not particularly interesting. Uh, so what we have, basically the, the chordal harmonic motion that we have going on that complements and contrasts this melody is basically, um, it's, it's this movement from E to D to C to D, and that movement progresses, that chordal movement progresses almost the way through, almost entirely the whole way through this three minute piece. And um, usually the chords, uh, what, the, what that is, is it's um, uh, E minor, D6, C major seventh, D6, and then back up to E. So basically what, what that basically is, it's just these triads going down. But with the B, which is our, our tonic, our root note, is just stays constant throughout. So you can have basically And one of the reasons why I like that and if, if you we open up the MIDI and look at this piece We'll see there's like a B running almost constantly throughout this entire piece even though parts and the melodies moving around The orchestration is moving all around and that creates a sense of like constancy and momentum that I wanted like a momentum and this con this uh, sense of continuation that just goes throughout the entire piece, and we basically achieve that with the chord progression that leaves that B you know, that works with that B static the entire time. So we end up having. So that's basically uh, the root of the idea. Now the structure of this piece is basically like an ABA structure. So we've got an A idea, and then we have uh, a middle, se uh, middle section, which is a little bit more contemplative, a little more med meditative, and there's a uh, different melody. And then we come back to our A, our A idea uh, basically at the, uh, at the end. So it's a very basic, uh, very simple structure a very simple chord progression that basically just repeats almost almost constantly. So from a from a compositional and structural point of view, it's just it's a very straightforward piece. It's not doing a lot of really complex uh, stuff. So one of the main goals was to um, it's got to keep this momentum up the whole way. We don't want it to slag to slack off. Uh, and it, just needs to, it needs to have a lot of energy and a lot of life to it, a lot of dynamic contrast to it, or else. You know, this is the sort of thing that can just get repetitive and boring uh, fairly quickly if if we're not keeping it interesting in some way. Um, so I think what I'm going to go ahead and talk about right now is some of the instruments that I'm using. First off, uh, for my piano, this is a Native Instruments Alicia's Keys, which I've had for a long time, and I have a lot of different piano libraries, but I keep coming back to this one a lot. There's just a clarity in the sound that is just continually appealing. So I keep coming back to this over and over and over. Um, and so we're using that. That's that's our uh, piano library. For strings, all the sustain and legato strings are soaring strings. Um, so you can see here, there they are. I have some short string articulations and these are being uh, performed with Musical Sampling's Adventure Strings, which is, you know, in the same way that Soaring Strings focuses on sustained and soaring string lines, Adventure Strings focuses on uh, short articulations. And I'll talk about that a little more in a, in a minute. Uh, Woodwinds-wise, I'm using two different things. The Berlin Woodwinds Main Library and the Berlin Woodwinds Soloists One Library. Now, just a note, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about woodwinds a little bit a little bit now. Um, so the Soloist One library is one of my favorite libraries, period. And for um, just a second here, I'm just making sure this is working. Turning on my 
There. It's just, it's really nice to play with. It's its my favorite uh, woodwind solo you know, library. My, my, well, it's probably actually my favorite woodwind library at all, even though it's just one of the expansions. Um, I don't use it for everything, but whenever I have solo woodwind parts, I mean, I'm almost always using that, uh, unless it's bassoon or some other instrument that's not included, just because it's, it's just got such a clear sound. The legatos are so, so good and so sensible. Um, so I love that. So most of the legato solo stuff uh, in the woodwinds is going to be that soloist one expansion library. For the rest of this, I'm using the Berlin Woodwinds, the legacy library. So if you buy, if bought Berlin Woodwinds in the last couple of years, you will have bought Berlin Woodwinds Revive. Now inside that package, you have the 3.0 samples which are the revived samples which are new which are new and then the original samples are I think it's uh, the 2.2 legacy samples and um, for this one I'm using 2.2 instead of the re more recent revolve sam uh, samples and there's a couple reasons for that uh, what, there's, so there's some differences between two, uh, the legacy the original Berlin woodwinds and uh, the, the uh, revive woodwinds uh, the sound is a little bit more different and maybe I have it's maybe it's just the microphone positions but in general the revive woodman library is um is a little bit more roomier the um, the tonal quality of the woodwinds is mostly a little bit softer you know not quite as bright um, just a, a little bit more dark and mellow and um, the legatos and are just are uh, not quite as fast or as responsive to my touch as the original uh, the legacy samples. So for this piece, you know, I wanted something that was a little bit brighter, um, a little bit more piercing, and some of the legatos that I am using, I wanted to be a little bit more agile. So in this piece, I didn't end up using the Revive uh, Woodwinds library. I ended up um, using the legacy uh, samples, which uh, are included in Berlin Woodwinds Revive, but they're just, you know, they're not the, the the most recent samples. So that's what I'm using library wise there. Choir, there's a short moment where we've got we've got choir doubling our melody. And this is the Metropolis Arc 2 Children's Choir Legato and Women's Choir Legato, which is really gorgeous. I really love the choir in, in um, these Metropolis Arc libraries, especially uh, number two. It's just so soft. Um, but we won't talk about this anymore just uh, because this is just a minor part of this piece. Uh, percussion. Um, there's actually an old VSL. Uh, this is part of the contract, Contact Factory Library uh, samples. Uh, it's a wooden tubular belt, and I just love the sound, so I always use that as my tubular bell sample, or almost always. Um, Cineperks, uh, timpani, and then Berlin percussion for the, the few other elements that we have here. But as you can see, uh, not real percussion heavy. We've got we got a little bit of, um, it's actually not a snare, it's actually a uh, simple scrape. Uh, it's just mislabeled. Uh, we've got uh, some cymbal swells, got a couple of tam-tam, I think, swells and hits, a little triangle, a little bit of xylophone to double some motion towards the end when we want it to get big. And um, a little bit of timpani just to add some weight in the bass. And um, some tubular bells. And but that's that's the percussion. That's all, that's all we have percussion-wise. So again, this is mostly strings, mostly woodwinds. And piano. So I'm going to briefly talk about the way I'm using the piano. Uh, but bef uh, but kind of as, as a prelude into that, a note that I want to just make is, in general, when it comes to orchestration and arrangement, when you're working with a whole bunch of instruments, which you are if you have an orchestra, um, the melody doesn't have to stay uh, with one instrument. You know, you might piano might be the main instrument who carries your library, but you can move move the melody all around it. And, and that's one thing I, I like to do: just assign it different places. Now, really, all pieces of music do this, but there's so many ways that you can give the melody to different instruments. Uh, just as an example, so like in, in this piece, 
Uh, we start off with, you know, the, we've got our little instrumental intro. Piano carries the melody for about eight bars. Then violins carry it for about eight. Then piano for about eight. Then uh, celli and bassoon carry the melody for about eight bars in the B section in the middle. Uh, vi uh, violins carry it again. Then violins and choir. Then piano. Then flute, oboe, and clarinet. And then flute and clarinet. So the melody is jumping all around between the orchestra, although not as much as in some of my music, actually. So let me go ahead and open up the piano MIDI. I'll unsolo that for now. So as you can see, the piano is doing, just by looking at the MIDI, you can see the piano is primarily doing two things. First off, it's reinforcing our chords and rhythms. Whoops, here we go, piano. With that kind of stuff. Or it's carrying the melody. And when it's carrying the melody, usually, like over here, it's not providing any chords or any other rhythmic, um, rhythmic accompaniment. Because I just wanted the clarity of the piano to focus on, focus on the melody. And all those other functions are being performed by the strings uh, and the woodwinds. Now this might seem, you know, if you're a piano player, this might seem, it might take some restraint to do this because, you know, who wants to use just one hand? I mean, you, you want to put your other hand in there and fill it out. But I, I, all, I just wanted that crystalline quality of just the piano, just one note at a time on the melody, and I arrange the accompaniment around that concept. And so when it's playing melody, usually it's just on melody. It's working kind of more as a percussive instrument than, you know, an, a filling it out instrument. Later here in the middle, you can see a similar function of reinforcing those chords and that rhythm. Towards the end, you can see when I get to like the big finale verse, you know, our A theme restated. Now I'm doing the same thing, but in octaves. So similar effect, but a little bit stronger because we have the octaves, uh, the octaves in our favor. From a rhythmic perspective, um, remember I mentioned we have like an ABA structure, you know, beginning, a middle, and then a, a uh, revisiting of the initial idea. We sort of have that, you know, this piece has that, that basic structure. Uh, there's also a rhythmic um, change towards in the B section. We start off with this eighth, this eighth notes rhythm. But once we get to the middle, the piano starts this arpeggiated um, Now we're in the B section, and we have an arpeggiated triplet, uh, triplet, pa triplet pattern. It's, it's like a it's like a twelve eight thing going on here. And one of the things that that does is it creates a feeling of changing gears. And uh, okay, okay, something new is happening now, even though there's only a very slight variation in the tempo. Um, so this is this is one great one great tool to keep in mind if you need to, if you need to have uh, you know make a, that that feeling of we're doing something new it's a change of pace it's a change of feel one way to do that even without changing orchestration or changing tempo one way to do that is just by changing the rhythmic um, the rhythmic emphasis or the, the undergirding rhythm so that's what we have through the B section. And it, it creates a nice a sense of transition for our B middle section. And then when we go back to our A section, we go back to our, our uh, staccato eighth notes. So let's listen to that. So that's basically how I'm using piano in this piece. 
uh, for melody or for rhythmic reinforcement. Uh, let's move on and talk about the strings briefly. All right. I'm going to just play some of the strings here. Uh, we got soaring strings and we have adventure strings. So adventure strings is, um, it, focus, it focuses on uh, short articulations and it's called adventure strings because it was emphasizing um, kind of an adventurous sound. Now the coolest thing about this library is that instead of having, you know, long patches, short patches and all the different kinds of patches, like, you know, just regular shorts, it's got these patches that it calls adventure patches. And what they're like highly intelligent patches and uh, basically what it allows you to do is if you play short, uh, it plays short. It plays a short uh, articulation. If you play long, it plays a long articulation. So, so f for that kind of stuff, which is makes it really fun to play. Um, and um, it, it's very inspiring as well to just open up and just play an, a, 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 um, you know, like a very active, very lively string part, particularly, you know, something kind of adventurous, you know, pirates, whatever, uh, just within one patch. So it's highly playable. And uh, so that's what I'm using. Uh, that's what I'm using for the short strings here. For the longer strings, uh, soaring strings, and I'm actually just going to isolate and play uh, just a little uh, some of the no, some of just soaring strings, so you can get a, a little bit of a, a feel for what that's sounding like. Move on a little bit later on. I really, really, this is, this is my, uh, the most fun string library to write with that I have just because it's so responsive. It's very good. It's very easy to get it sounding good quickly uh, and relatively easily. So it's, you know, it's just, um, you know, if I just grab some Chelly, it's just. It's very, um, it's got a very intense expressive uh, uh, vibrato as well. So as you can see, it's sounding pretty lush. Now, one thing I want to show you briefly is a little bit of um, how I'm getting the strings to sound this way, because it's, it's partly the library, it's partly the um, reverb and EQ that I have, I have going. So I'm going to show you that briefly, because I've had a number of people ask me, like, how are you getting the strings to sound this way? Uh, Cause like I really, I'm really liking how how they sound. So where we go? let's take a look at this. What do we have here? I'm using quantum leap spaces. I'm using two instances of a reverb. I'm using a Berlin Church, a 2.2 second. So that's a not as long of a tail. And then I'm also using. Come on, where we go? Where we go? I want, I want that back. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm also using, I believe, a uh, another instance of FX2. Quantum Leap Spaces. Oh, no, I'm not. This is a, uh, well, yeah, I, I am. It's not what I thought it was. This is a, a violin, viola, uh, s south, uh, th th anyway, th this hall. So I'm using the two of them in combination. But I'm, I'm something that also uh, is important is the what I'm doing with the EQ here. And so let me just go ahead and open, open that up. Um, I was watching a video by uh, Mike Patty a few years ago. He was talking about uh, doing EQ on strings. And he talked about this trick uh, to get this uh, violin sounding a little bit more airy and silky. And basically, uh, to e dip the EQ right around the, the 5,000 mark and then to lift the upper end a little to increase air. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, grab a, like a passage of, this, of the strings here. I'm gonna I'm going to toggle uh, the EQ on and off. I'm gonna bypass it so you can hear the difference. Now you may not like what I did to the sound with the change, but this is just to give you an idea of, of what it's doing. So those are so this is with the EQ, without the EQ. So as you can see, there's a little bit of like a, a harshness and a hiss around that 5,000 hertz range. So by dipping that down, uh, I'm, I'm basically creating a smoother, silkier sound. It, it almost ends up sounding like a, like a simulated consordino. Um, so that's, that's something I'm doing. So if you listen to it um, with no reverb and no EQ, it sounds like it sounds like this. With the Q and verb. So anyway, those are the strings. Now these are made for very like soaring, athletic legato lines. But as you can see, uh, this library works pretty well for just kind of this lush chordal stuff. Uh, one last thing I want to point out about these strings before moving on is uh, you can see that my voicing is fairly open. Again, it's a lot of octaves, fourths, and fifths. And um, that's just kind of, I sort of wanted a, a Thomas Newman-y kind of uh, kind of a sound in, in the way that I voice these. So it's not as Williams-esque. Uh, there's not as many tight chords. There's not as many uh, like close chords up in the um, uh, up in the violin range either. Adventure strings, I'm kind of overriding a little bit. It's almost like I have two different string sections. And it's just doing some pretty basic um, rhythmic reinforcement stuff. So um, this library, obviously, Adventure Strings, that's what I'm talking about. I really like the adventure patches, and uh, I like the attacks. Uh, it's not actually my favorite library in terms of the sound of the shorts. Um, Cinematic Studio Streams uh, Strings, at this point, is my favorite library in terms of how the short articulations sound. Um, so I mostly use that for shorts today, but if I could somehow mix the two, if I could get the playability of adventure strings uh, with this, you know, playing short, like the adventure patch technology, if I could get that and mix it with the sound of the cinematic studio strings, a short articulations, 
that would probably be just too much of a good thing. So they're they're different. I use them for different things, um, different strengths. You know, uh, different strengths there. Woodwinds wise, I, I do want to show you a little bit of this woodwinds writing because I, I guess I just like how it turned out. Um, I'm using a lot of woodwind runs. Um, these add color. These add flourish. Uh, these are also effective at um, at um, anticipating uh, significant downbeats. So using runs like right here, there's a, there's an important downbeat right here because this is where our melody begins. So I've got it. This little downward run, um, getting re getting us ready for and working towards that downbeat. There's a little bit of a, you know, the timing is offset, you know, to make sure that it hits it basically at the same time. Well, I'll just play you a little bit of what we have here. So there's a couple places where it carries the melody. Uh, a lot of the time it's just adding these runs and it's, as we see here, it's giving us our, you know, that eighth note pattern, you know, it's reinforcing our chords, but it's also giving us that rhythmic, uh, that rhythmic, rhythmic momentum that I want, it just needs to keep pushing forwards and pushing forwards. So those are the main couple ways I'm using this library. The patches that I'm using for these runs, I mean, I, th I feel like these end up working out really nicely. as the uh, runs transition patches, which I use a lot and I talk about kind of a lot. Um, you can just play very fast, agile stuff in uh, right away and you can make your own runs. There's one cool thing uh, that I do with the runs here at the end, which I'll just give you a little peek at. So we have like clarin uh, um, let's see, what, what all do we have here? Okay, we've got oboes going up and we have flutes coming down. Wait a second, where am I? That's, that's not right, is it? No, we've got clarinets going up. What, uh, flutes going down, clarinets going up. And it, it makes this really neat little contrary wise motion effect. Let's go ahead and play that in uh, context. And then the woodwinds finish off the melody. And again, these are the runs tra transition patches, and uh, they work tolerably, tolerably bleh, well uh, for carrying the melody here because the melody is is um, it's it's shorter and it's and I like I like the uh, the legato transitions up. Those are really nice. So it works well for something, uh, something like like this. So there's a little overview of of the woodwinds, and as you can see, 
in terms of reinforcing that the rhythm, you know, right here, strings are doing it. We've got woodwinds on some melody. Here, woodwinds are really doing that. Piano, right here, piano's on melody. We really need the strings reinforcing that that uh, progressive momentum. Here we have piano is doing that. We've got some string, and then your strings are doing something else. So there's a lot of switching jobs. But you know, when one section is doing something else, give the other section, you know, that section's, jo section's job. So you've still got all your basic elements uh, represented and moving. Uh, now, one, one final uh, principle that I want to talk about in this video, and there's actually a number of other things I could talk about, is something that I call filling the gap. And I'm sure there's a better, better term for this that I just don't know the name for. Uh, but oftentimes when you have a melody, um, you know, a traditional melody will have gaps in it. Your little places where, you know, if it was a song, it would be a breath. Uh, pauses and gaps in the phrasing. And when you have a moment like that, it's often or usually a good idea to have some kind of instrumental element that fills uh, fills that gap. Something that's maybe a background element, but in that moment, it comes partway into the foreground. And there's a couple reasons for this. One reason is to keep things interesting, um, you know, to keep the... Um, you know, keep, keep the arrangement from, you know, being uninteresting in those gaps, because depending on how long those are, sometimes, uh, you know, it can, you can lose that. Uh, but also to keep the momentum going, because sometimes when you get to those pauses, it's kind of like everything just stops and there's kind of an awkward, you feel like you're waiting for the melody to start up again. And you don't usually want that feeling. So um, there's a couple things that I'm doing to quote, fill the gap. Uh, as you note, let's open up our piano and our strings here. I kind of have like a, our main melody kind of has a, a, a A1 and an A2, kind of like a, a sort of a call and answer thing. So let's see here, we've got our, we have two bars of, and if we just continued without that, Da, 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 in the middle that fills that gap, it would just be like, okay, here's our melody statement. Hody hum, let's wait, wait for a minute for it to come back. Okay, here it is again. Uh, but we wouldn't have something moving the music forward. So it's important to have something filling that gap. Now, this is such a, a, a big gap. You know, this is like, you know, every two bars, we've got this gap. So I kind of wrote this melody around there being sort of a call and answer, like a second part. Uh, that answers back. But the gap can be filled in a lot of ways. It can be filled with a little um, a little melody line that kind of is complementary. It can be filled with something that leads into, like a lead in to our next melody moment. Here in the B section, we have our, um, we have our main B melody. Here we go up here. And we need that something to fill the gap there, uh, and that's celli and violas. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. It can be done by uh, orchestral effects, like um, cymbals, you know, cymbal rolls, uh, harp glissandos, woodwind runs. These are often put in those gaps, partly to fill the gap and partly to anticipate the next big downbeat of the melody. So be conscientious about where your gaps are, the gaps in your melody. Uh, and that's those are the places basically where you have the opportunity to make the transitions powerful and interesting. Um, and just look out for those because it can be a place where your piece just kind of falls flat for a few seconds. So look out for those in between, those in between moments. So um, that's pretty much all I have to say about this piece for right now. Uh, anyway, these are some great libraries that I'm using, uh, but I, I hope that um, you learned a couple of things from the some of these notes about the libraries, about EQ, about reverb, but we didn't talk about reverb a ton. And uh, hopefully uh, some of this information you're going to be able to uh, implement in some of your own compositions. Anyways, uh, thank, thank you so much for joining me for this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.